Testing. All right, if everyone wants to find their way to a seat here, then we'll get started. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah? I can speak up. I've done it before, but I was taught that you're supposed to love the mic. But then you're supposed to actually like lick it and stuff, and I'm not, or like, like put your lips on it. Like that's how you're supposed to know that you're close enough when you're playing with a band. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We did. Robert, you're last. Really? Yeah. Just restarting real You want to be last? I can do it. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. You can just, you know. No? You want to be first? You want to do the intro? You want to host? Robert Jackson. Ember. No? Oh, okay. okay. No, I just get more views with this. Okay, I'll just mean you'll ramble longer and longer. Seems good. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen this before. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, welcome. No, we need a little bit. Do should I just hold it? Should I just hold it? Yeah. Gotta love the microphone tonight. I feel like I must be louder to myself over here. I must be underneath the speaker if I walk over here. No, I'm still pretty loud. OK, cool. OK, welcome to Ember NYC April edition. Uh, for anyone who hasn't met me or doesn't know me, my name is Matthew Beal. Uh, I'm a member of the EmberJS core team. I work here at Adapar, and we're happy to have you all here tonight to talk about Ember uh, and some RFCs. So the format that we're going to do tonight is a format that I invented just in time to post the, uh, the meetup itself on the website. It is an RFC roundup in which we're going to have people go through. Uh, everyone's committed here to doing like a 5 to 15 minute talk on one of these RFCs. They're going to walk us through the motivation, some of the details of the design about the thing, maybe some of the conversations people had or some example usage, um, things like that. A lot of these APIs are in uh, Ember Octane, which if you haven't used it before, is a, like a, a brand new edition of Ember coming. And I'm going to explain what editions are for my um, talk. So seems good. Uh, before we start going, though, thank you, Adapar, and Adapar people who are here, like Greg, for giving us a hand tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, and before we dive in, would anyone like to stand up and do uh, an announcement or anything to share? All right. Cool. No announcements tonight. Sounds good. We'll go ahead and dive right in. <clears throat> so uh, before we go into uh, additions, which is the RFC that I'm going to talk about, for those who's familiar with the RFC process in Ember, so most people are pretty familiar with this, so I won't take too much time here, but I think I have some interesting context. So RFCs, uh, RFC stands for Request for Comment. This is a process that was first loosely formalized and then actually formalized um, by people building the internet, ARPANET, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the first RFC, it was titled Host Software, which sounds, it is as boring as it sounds. It was not super cool. Other things that RFCs did were uh, codify things like ASCII. There's actually like a one paragraph RFC that's like RFC three or four. That's like, we should use seven bytes and then one for capitalization. It's like, uh, there it is, cool. Um, some other uh, RFCs, uh, yeah, the, the first RFC that I think is interesting for us to look at, though, that one must be a different one, because it is RFC 3. Uh, RFC 3 is the RFC which uh, created RFCs, which was like, oh, we should have a thing <laughs> called RFCs. Um, I really, yes, uh, I, I, really, I really appreciate that the working network working group seems to consist of these individuals. If you wanted to know how formal the early process of working on Ember was, it was about as formal as this. 
Yeah, and membership is not closed. Uh, and notes may be produced on, uh, at any site and by at any site at the time. This is early internet. So basically, a lot of people at UCLA are sitting in a room and they're like, ah, we are deciding the protocols that we will use. And the idea was other internet sites, other sites that are on part of the network can also come up with things that they want to uh, include in this list of proposals. Do you know what day that was? We might be on the 50th. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's April. It might be. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Let's say we are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I, I, yeah. So I think the key things are like anyone can participate in this process, which is fantastic and uh, is part of one of the things that we like about this process. Uh, and there's a very low bar for submission. Uh, anyone can submit something. And if you look down here a little bit, they uh, encourage you to share philosophical positions without examples or other specifics or specific suggestions or implementation techniques uh, without introductory or background explanation. And there's like spelling errors, it's great. Um, but yeah, the idea was like, share your thought, don't keep it to yourself, get people talking about it and get some responses. Some other RFCs that came out over the following years, um, also all in April, uh, I might say at the very, very beginning of April, uh, RFC 748 was Telnet randomly lose. Uh, this engineer found out that some of the services that he would Telnet into would sometimes randomly lose information that he was sending them. And he was like, oh, this isn't good. I could use a feature flag to tell me when their server is going to randomly lose my information. So he codified it into an RFC. Uh, and that started a tradition that was followed in a lot of these other ones. Uh, the transmission of IP datagrams on avian carriers, which was eventually updated in the IP over avian carriers with quality of service. Backflow, yeah. Uh, the um, the sonnet to sonnet uh, s o n e t is a some kind of data protocol. I don't even understand. But basically, they decided that we'll just reference actual sonnets in Shakespeare's collection according to the number of the frame. So, like frame sixteen would just be the entirety of sonnet sixteen. Worked pretty well. Uh, I think a classic here is the hypertext coffee pot protocol, which was again also updated several years later. Uh, these engineers are not that creative. Uh, and this is the memo for the Consortium of Slow Commotion Research, which is a Vint Cerf uh, RFC that he wrote. Uh, it uses a highly redundant optical communication technique. He was really into military at this point, evidently. The basic unit is an M1A1 tank, each tank labeled with the number 01, painted four feet high, a day glow luminescent paint. Uh, and then they come up with some methods by which you could observe this data and consume it. Seems excellent. Okay. Uh, so when really low bar. Yes, very low bar for. I'm actually shocked that Ember hasn't uh, done the same thing. But regardless, let that inspire someone. Uh, so <clears throat> I think we, being people using the internet much later, think of RFCs as something which codifies exactly what the protocol is. We think of like there's an RFC for HTTP 1.0, and we're like, ah, that's that's where the thing is. Uh, this process is a little bit more formalized now in IETF, obviously. You can't just, like the original protocol for writing an RFC was please mail it to these eight people and they will like photocopy it in their office and give it to other people at their site. <laughs> it's a little more formal now. You actually create a thing called an internet draft, which is more akin to a lot of what these are, where it's an opportunity for discussion. And then the internet draft itself is, uh, there's a working group and the working group turns it into an RFC and then the RFC is voted on by IETF members and the consortium, then it gets really bureaucratic. Is the working group membership closed? Uh, given that it's the IETF today, it, it's probably not closed if you have a big enough checkbook. Okay, um, so uh, that's basically how RFCs work today. Uh, anyone can author, anyone can comment and discuss. So two big things that RFCs do that we want to emulate are open participation. Anyone can participate in this process, and that's a thing that we want Ember's RFC process to um, adhere to in some way or the other. And uh, that they are based on a consensus process. So the way that an RFC was like accepted as a, or, or the way that an RFC in IETF today definitely is a thing that which is accepted by IETF is that the working group comes to consensus. There's no one person on the working group who says this, this thing is like go or no go. It's the group of people on the working group who decide together that this is appropriate and we want to move it forward to the rest of the IETF group. Um, and that's another thing that Ember strives for in its RFC process. So to talk a little bit more about uh, Ember's RFCs, we have a couple different sections. These 
course, roughly correlate with IETF ones or a variety of other processes. Ember is also very inspired by Rust's RFC process. Um, summary, the motivation section is usually a great place to start if you want to start reading RFCs, and it usually explains the problem, which is the most interesting part of the RFC very often. Uh, of course, another interesting part can be the detailed design, which gets you into the nitty gritty of what the actual solution is. Um, things that I think in how we can teach this is an important part of Ember since we are more approachable software, let us say, than most RFCs. Most RFCs are defining protocols, so you don't really need to worry about how to teach it, just how to know that it's correct or incorrectly implemented. Uh, in Ember, we actually need to understand how we're gonna communicate this to new users as they ramp up. Uh, I think drawbacks and alternatives are maybe the hardest section of an RFC to write when I write an RFC, and, uh, but can be some of the most interesting. I think alternatives are a great opportunity for you to note prior art things that other people have tried somewhere and that you're rejecting for whatever reason. Just list them and say why you think that they're not appropriate. Cool, uh, life cycle of an Ember feature. If people are pretty familiar with this, then I'll do the quick version here. I think the callouts would be that step three here is that you're supposed to find a core team champion. This is like a little bit new, but if you want to submit an RFC, it's always been kind of in your best interest to have someone who's part of the Ember.js core teams who can advocate for it in, in meetings that happen with those groups. Um, so we, that is actually a documented part of the process now. Um, I don't know how we declare a champion. <laughs> for instance, on the additions RFC, uh, Tom Dale is, I'm pretty sure, the champion, but he is actually not explicitly listed anywhere as being the champion. I just happen to know that he's the champion, which is funky. You, you, you assigned the champion yeah. in the repo. Oh, so we should check if Tom is assigned. That would be cool. Yeah. Uh, when an RFC enters final comment period, that's the relevant core team. This is also kind of actually a little bit loosey-goosey in Ember right now. Uh, who is the relevant core team that can say a thing is going to final comment period? But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because final comment period is not a, an RFC being accepted. It's a, a, a red flag for people who care to speak up and say something. So that means that anyone could step in and say, like, ah, I have a relevant piece of information that I'd like to share. So uh, it really doesn't matter necessarily who moves into final comment period. <clears throat> If you want to follow final comment period things, they all get a tweet. So if you just follow the Ember.js uh, Twitter account, you will know when something goes to FCP. Uh, and after a week, if we don't have any new information, the RFC is like presumed to be ready to merge unless someone raises something at the last minute, which of course can happen. Uh, then it basically goes through Ember's feature flag and beta and release cycle. Any, any particular questions about this from anyone? Excellent question. Yes, the other thing that could happen is an RFC could actually not be merged. We could decide this is not a direction that we want to head. Uh, and in that case, this is also a recent change to the process. We FCP to close, um, which also does not get a tweet, I don't believe, but does get a label on the GitHub repo uh, and a comment from uh, someone in the group that's doing FCP to close to you know, explain their justification for what they think's going on. Uh, final comment period. There, there are two, yeah. Uh, and uh, we now track RFC implementation status in, in our tracking repo. Yep. So there is a single issue that's supposed to span all the teams, and the yep. individual teams check off on it. And yeah, so Robert's, um, in case there's anyone online who can't hear, Robert's saying that uh, there is an RFC tracking issue. There's an RFC tracking repo. I'll show us a screenshot of that as well. And that's where once something is merged, if you want to figure out, like, how's it going? How are you proceeding? You can go to the RFC tracking repo and you should be able to see if we're getting anything done on it. So uh, the, the fairly quick version here uh, is that this is the RFC repo. You can find that Ember.js RFCs. The important little bits to look for here are the uh, text link right there it is quite innocent, but the text link is what takes you to the important bit, which is all of the merged and accepted RFCs. So these are all things that the Ember project has committed to saying, hey, these are ideas that we like that we want to move forward with. Please help us or we are working on them, things like that. Uh, the other thing which would be useful is the pull request tab, which will show you draft RFCs. So draft RFCs are what most people write. They are things that have not been merged yet or been rejected. Seems useful. And you can see there's tags for final comment period on a couple of them and things like that. Looks great. Uh, if you were to look at a pull request, here is additions, for example. Um, you can see this is not Another thing that's not formalized but is useful, everyone usually puts like a rendered or a preview link or something that links to their RFC on GitHub. Uh, it can be, because this is not automated, um, 
sometimes people make this link and they make it pointing to a SHA instead of pointing to a branch title in, uh, in the URL, which means you might be going to an old version. So I, I, like, I had to edit this one when I was working on this RFC to make sure it was pointed at the most recent thing. So it's a good thing to double check is when, you're, when you hover over the link, is it showing you a branch name or is it showing you a SHA? Is that SHA really the most recent thing that exists for the RFC? Uh, yeah, so uh, I feel like I have this in a slide somewhere, but the, the thing that you would be encouraged to do is actually to open an issue. So if you're not ready to write an RFC, but you have a problem, you should open an issue and describe your problem at length and say, like, this is something I'm running into. I don't have solutions yet. Here are ideas or here are, like, a rough sketch of what's going on. Other people chime in. Tell me that you have the same problem. Uh, Cool. Uh, so this is the RFC repo. This is what an RFC text actually looks like when it's in draft mode. Uh, note that the RFC PR and the Ember issue themselves are blank. I guess this is like roughly the tracking information, and there's also a tracking repo that we'll look at. But once it gets merged, you'll see that there's relevant teams added, and there's a RFC PR is back referenced and stuff like that. The, um, the file itself gets updated. So this is now 0417. This is the on modifier RFC. So it gets the, the number which matches up with the pull request if you want to go actually find the discussion that led to the thing. Uh, there's also an RFC reader, which is linked from the RFC's page as well as like the website for the RFC repo, and this is maybe a little bit nicer. There's no drafts on here. These are just things which are uh, actually merged RFCs, but they're good to reference. There's a URL on this on modifier one for the tracking repo. This, again, is a fairly new thing, but there's a tracking repo where you can go say, I want to see the progress of um, if this one is moving forward, uh, and Robert has, is assigned this one, so you know it's moving forward. Um, Seems excellent. So the tracking repo is a new thing. Kitty Gengler maintains it right now. She wants to automate more of it, and they're working on that process. OK. So uh, any questions about RFC process at all? Yeah, sounds good. OK, let's talk about additions. Cool. Uh, so additions is an RFC. If you would like to follow along, if you have a laptop out, then you would want to go to pull request 371, which is the additions um, RFC. Okay, so uh, the first thing that I think we should probably, well, this is just like at a high level what's going on in this RFC. Um, so there's a draft. The authors are this guy, Dave Wasmer and Tom. Uh, and they've been working really closely on this. I think Dave was actually encouraged by Tom to write this, which is often how an RFC gets started. Uh, Tom is definitely the champion. Uh, this is the summary of what it does, not the motivation section, but just at a high level. Uh, they give us an opportunity to bring our documentation marketing up to date to reflect the improvements we've made since the previous edition which, of course, has a couple layers of um, you know, hand wave, and we're going to get into a little bit more detail. So why would we want to create this thing called additions? Uh, well, to steal a couple things from the keynote before looking at some other examples, Ember wants to, uh, uh, any piece of open source software has this constant balance that it needs to strike in between making progress, but also having enough stability that people can rely on it over time. Uh, and that's something which can actually get out of whack pretty easily. Uh, and I think this can happen to any project, and there's definitely specific examples of where this has happened in Ember. But you get into cycles where you make a lot of changes, and then somebody reacts to those changes, and they go, oh, man, you're, you're breaking my apps, or, or the libraries in the community aren't keeping up with the changes that you're making. And so you go, OK, well, I'll slow down. But then you get into this phase where you're moving far too slowly, and everyone's like, well, you're not getting anything done. Where are all the new features? And so you jump back into it, and you're like, ah, oh, here's a bunch of new changes. And then everyone's like, ah, all over again. So uh, how can we get out of that habit? Uh, this is a lesson, another lesson that we've learned from Ember 113, which taught the Ember project uh, a lot of lessons. But Ember 113, we did a lot of really aggressive changes, uh, which were Great, wonderful improvements, but also a lot of deprecations and things that people had to do to clean up their apps in order to move forward. And then in 2.0, in parts of the 2.0 cycle, people felt like we were just making releases that didn't actually have any changes in them. They felt like we were falling behind. So we don't want this to continue, of course. In number 3.0, we want to be steady in moving forward. So how can we do that? Uh, a, really, a term that I think is really excellent for describing this is the pit of incoherence. We have a world where we are right now, and we want to make small changes to get to where we want to be. But we know that we're going to have this point where our small changes might not all quite line up. We haven't done all the small changes yet, so there might be things that don't make sense when they're juxtaposed. And how do we get to a point where those things can be 
on the same page. Um, we want to choose the moments when we teach our software uh, so that there are moments when the software is actually ready to be adopted by people who don't have context. When we're in those incoherent moments, you lean a lot on your own previous experience, things that you know from having used Ember in previous versions or something like that. And uh, these moments of high coherence when everything aligns are great moments for new people to start using the software. So we want an opportunity to bring new people in on these as well. So uh, the idea here is to take the high points of coherence when everything makes sense and find a way to celebrate them. Ember already has major releases like any software would, any open source software does. The thing is our, our, our semantic version releases of Ember, we've committed to doing something else that's a little bit more like above and beyond in Semver, and that is that a major version of Ember, like 3.0, doesn't add any new features at all. It only removes features which we've flagged as deprecated. And that way, the breaking change that we're making as we go from major version to major version is actually very small. It's only removing things that already have warnings. There's nothing new to learn, which is great. It gets everyone to move forward to that thing with you. But the problem is you can't really celebrate that, because who wants to be like, rah, I was forced to delete things and change how I'm using APIs. That's not very exciting. Uh, so instead, uh, we want to uh, enter this cadence of being able to say, OK, somewhere in number 3.9 or 3.11, we'll declare one of these releases to be a new thing called Octane, which will be our addition. And then every release after that will be also considered an Octane release. And so Octane doesn't really correspond to a specific release. It's not Ember 3.9 or 3.10, which is Octane there's just always a latest version of Octane. In the same way that you might say right now, there's always a latest version of Ember Classic. So if you're using Ember 3.8 today, which is stable, then you're still using Ember Classic, I would say, would be the addition of Ember that you're using, although we, we didn't obviously didn't have an addition system until now. Cool. Uh, from the RFC here, the additions are not about uh, they are not about communicating API changes like versions. They're about clearly communicating with a set of new APIs, unlock new programming model, have landed. Uh, what is a new programming model that we might put together? Um, a great thing to look for on RFCs is to actually look at the comments where the discussion happens. So in the discussion here, uh, Tom actually gets asked, what do you mean by programming model? And dives into it a little bit to say that he's talking about the mental model developers should have of the framework and how different abstractions should be combined and deployed to solve a particular problem, which we're going to look at components and how Ember does that in just a moment here. Uh, another really interesting comment that was like in the middle of this long book that Tom wrote responding to something uh, is breaking this down to different perspectives. Um, for a user, this is a new way to start thinking about Ember. So if you've never used Ember before, Ember Octane is like, ah, this is how I learned this new thing is this Octane world. So it doesn't matter if Ember introduces new APIs after that. If we don't consider them part of like the Octane feature set, we don't necessarily need to teach them to those new people. We can save those for like another edition that we do later on, even though we can still document them, of course, and things like that. And from the contributor perspective, this is also really useful because it helps us identify when we know that we've uh, finished a chunk of work. And that's another thing that's really hard in Ember today. We don't, it's been hard to identify like a moment of accomplishment when you're like, we all pushed toward a goal and we achieved it. Because the goal, same thing with users of Ember, like the goal of, oh, we all got to the goal of 3.0 and deleted things. Eh. You know, it's not super exciting. But the goal of we all got to Octane and we've shipped this whole new model of using Ember is, is really engaging and pushes you to do um, more interesting stuff. Uh, and this is a little bit of an, an, an inversion. I've been saying like the high point of coherence. And uh, here he talks about, in addition, marking the low point of incoherence, just the opposite. But basically, these are this is to identify those peaks or the moment when we want to do these things. OK, so what do we want from APIs that we include in an addition? Um, to jump through a couple of things we want to see from them. So for example, this is angle bracket invocation here. So we've got close icon, and this is a new syntax that um, we're going to get walked through a little bit later on or that you may already be using. Because this is implemented, you can use this in your Ember apps. I'm not sure what version, how far back the polyfill goes. Robert, do you know how far back the polyfill goes for angle bracket? At least 210. 210? That's pretty awesome. So. I keep thinking of 210 as being like, like 210 is kind of like, I don't know if 113 is when classic began or 210 is, but 210 is like a really solid start uh, point where the rendering engine really hasn't changed dramatically since 210. So that's like a, a really high point of coherence in the system. Uh, so uh, in 210, you can consider this thing implemented. 
but we're not recommending it, it's just implemented. So when we have it as part of an addition, we actually want to be recommending this thing. Another uh, thing that we'd want out of an API is that it's integrated with other APIs in the system. So in this case, we're also introducing another new feature. In, in classic Ember, we invoke components with curly curly syntax up here, which has certain behaviors and we're changing that. Uh, we also have the action helper, so if you want to attach to mouse up, you'd use this syntax for a variety of reasons, which Kevin will walk us through. We're changing our syntax to instead use curly curly on with a, you know, a different invocation. Those things actually can work together. Like they, they cohere in an interesting way. And the, the, the other things didn't do that. And if we taught these one at a time, we might have missed that opportunity to say like, look, there's actually a very simple way to think about this. Anything with an angle bracket is a element, is like a, an element invocation or a component invocation. They just behave the same. Pass attributes to them, pass modifiers to them, and it's all one system. Uh, we want to document classic APIs, but we don't necessarily teach them to new people using the framework. So we might land them and sure, there's documentation. If you asked, someone would help you use the thing. If you're writing an add-on, you should consider it stable, but we might not recommend it to brand new people touching the framework because we don't think it makes sense or is easy to comprehend what's going on at least. Uh, you can use it, but in Octane, like a, a large part of Octane is, I think the most practical thing you could point to is that uh, Octane is the addition of new, the landing of new blueprints and generators to default Ember applications. So when you run, uh, when you run Ember new, whoops. Oh, I thought, sorry, I thought, oh yeah, sorry. When you run Ember new or Ember G components uh, on a classic app, on a 3.8 app, then you will get uh, a classic component. You will get a curly curly component. But if you install Ember, 3.10 or 3.11, then out of the box, you'll get all of the new stuff all at once. So it'll feel like a very different framework, and that's like a big, a big switch. Uh, the last thing is kind of social. Uh, if we have an API that we landed, and it's a little bit early, like angle bracket components, uh, you don't see a lot of add-ons saying, we support Ember 2.10. Here is how you use angle bracket invocation. And I think that's good. It's possible for them to do it, but we're not actually encouraging them to as a community. Uh, we want them, everyone to wait until all these things have like gelled and come together. And then all at once, hopefully we see add-ons and mass kind of moving over to the new syntax so that the new world becomes really common. So they're also useful for organizing greater contribution. Cool. Um, the status of the editions RFC uh, is that it's basically sitting on uh, kind of sitting on Tomdale at this point, but the thing that he's waiting on is he's waiting for us to actually ship Octane. Uh, and this might seem a little bit backwards, but there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem. As we go through the process of shipping the Octane, um, as, as shipping the Octane edition, we'll have the opportunity to make changes to this and to like take any lessons that we learn and fold them back into the process. And we wanted to preserve the opportunity. So we're kind of going through it, and then we want to land it after we land the actual Octane edition. Uh, Great. That is my walkthrough of the additions RFC. Any questions? Yeah? What's the next one going to be called? What is the naming convention? I don't want to say because there is a name often used, but I really don't like it. <laughs> so I'm just not going to tell you what the next edition will be called after Octane. <laughs> which, which core team not specified? <laughs> OK, seems excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, we're going to have John step up, and he's going to walk us through some fast boot. So I saw the Linux. Yeah. I saw the Linux thing, and I was like, "Oh, this is going to be something." <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 
Jonathan Jackson. Hey, everybody. Oh, wow. Hey. Um, yeah, so I'm Jonathan Jackson. Um, I'm going to be talking about an RFC that I've been working on uh, <clears throat> for like two months or so. Uh, not that it will feel like that when you actually look at it, because it's kind of small. Um, I recently joined the Fastboot team. Uh, I think several members are here. Robert, Ryan is here somewhere. Ryan's got headphones on. He can't hear me. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, in, in some of my past work as a consultant at 201, uh, I worked on um, a feature in Fastboot called rehydration. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's actually possible to rehydrate your apps right now. And I know you probably don't know what I'm talking about yet. So hopefully we'll get through that. Um, just, I guess, a show of hands, who has uh, either used or knows what Fastboot is? OK, so like the majority of people who are in attendance. Um, well, uh, I'm going to pretend like you all kept your hands down uh, so that I can actually explain my RFC. <clears throat> um, this is what it looks like. Oh, uh, I'm Jonathan Jackson. Uh, I run a podcast, too. And I wanted to point something out uh, that champions, uh, this spec for champions that you mentioned in, or Matt mentioned earlier, uh, oh, wow, you can't see not, you cannot see my screen. There we go. We're almost there. There we go. Yeah, this is in this is in uh, 2015. So, it's been it's been a minute. Okay. Sorry, I wanted to bring that up earlier. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so uh, we do uh, RFC roundups uh, on that podcast as well. So if uh, you are interested in continuing to follow along with RFCs, you should check that out as well. Um, okay. So. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it relatively short and talk. Uh, I'm going to try to answer five questions. Uh, uh, I'm, we're going to talk about the considerations uh, when you start thinking about what Fastboot uh, is meant to do and how you should use it and how you should think about it. And we're going to think about some different use cases. Uh, my slide deck is a little thin, so I'm not going to have too many visualizations. So it's going to be a lot of me talking. Uh, sorry. Uh, and then we're going to talk about when is SSR, and that means uh, server-side rendering. When is that preferable? Like, who is, who is best served by SSR? Uh, we're going to talk about what rehydration is, uh, hopefully. Uh, why is it better uh, than not having rehydration? Um, this is a separate question than why you would want to use SSR versus CSR, which I'll be uh, calling a client-side rendering. Um, it's a different question, uh, and we'll see why. And then uh, how do we implement? And uh, these are the only questions I'm going to kind of go through real fast for the RFC. Hopefully, the RFC will answer this if you look through it. Um, at least that's my goal. Uh, but yeah, let's just dive in. Oh, actually, I'm missing my notes. So um, in terms of the, con uh, the considerations, uh, I think the first thing I need to do is kind of define what server-side rendering kind of is uh, versus client-side rendering. So client-side rendering is kind of a traditional web app. Uh, you, as a user, would go to your computer. You would type in a URL. The URL would go all the way to the server, and the server would churn for a little minute, and then it would deliver you a string, and your browser would take that string and display it. It would render some DOM. Uh, for a long time, that's how the web worked. Uh, then we started adding some JavaScript in. So it would send that. It would churn, send that string. There'd be a little JavaScript. Uh, and then JavaScript would start doing some stuff. And then as we got more and more complicated, we realized that to deliver rich interactions, we would want to send a bulk amount of JavaScript together and have it be kind of an, an, an entire app that we deliver as a payload. The browser would render, and then it would pull down a whole bunch of JavaScript. And then you kind of would get this magic moment where everything loaded and it was ready to go. Um, and that's more. Uh, Client-side rendering. So when I say client-side rendering, I'm referring to like when you send a JS payload through and you get your app to um, to load. So when we talk about server-side rendering, we're not talking about that old way of sending just DOM. Uh, I guess we kind of are, but it's kind of a mix and match. It's a hodgepodge of the two different strategies. So uh, you want to send DOM such that it can be rendered immediately. 
That's important because you want to show things to users very fast. Um, and there's some other reasons you might want to do this. But then you, you, want, you still want that rich user interaction that you know, we come to know and appreciate from JavaScript frameworks and you know, JavaScript payloads. So, um, so we're not really talking about, when, when I say SSR, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about a very specific set of like a, a, a merge, a hybrid of the two different styles. Um, so for our case in Ember, we have a thing called Fastboot. Uh, and it is a server-side piece that allows you to make a request. The user will still send, enter a URL, just like every other request. The server, the Fastboot server, will then churn for some period of time. It will produce a, a string that represents the DOM that your application is. So if you visit you know, foo route, it will literally print out the DOM for foo route and send it back to a uh, user. Uh, oh, wow. I just realized. Oh no, we're good. Um, it will send. It will send it through. Sorry, <laughs> my slides are still a little fuzzy. Uh, yeah. So Fastboot will send it. Send it down, and then uh, that DOM will be parsed by your browser and displayed immediately. Uh, uh, several JavaScript link tags will fire and pull down your Ember code. And if the user waits long enough before navigating to another route, it will boot the Ember application. The uh, the current state of Fastboot, it will then destroy the old DOM. Like it actually loops through all of the DOM nodes and destroys them, uh, and then Ember takes over and rebuilds the DOM again. So you have this period of time, and this is the thing that is the consideration that I really want to drive home. Uh, the consideration is that there is a period of time when the user has an app that they can see that does not function. And that's tricky to describe and it's tricky to think about. Um, there are some mitigating uh, strategies that we're going to talk about in a minute, about how you might uh, kind of code around that such that it still feels nice. And uh, some of the other things that I wanted you to consider is what happens with an input. So you deliver this you know, dummy app, basically, kind of a placeholder app, and a user enters some input in. What do you expect to happen when, when Ember, excuse me, when Ember um, loads in? Well, I, Fastboot currently will just, just throw it away. It just, it's thrown away. The user's uh, expectations are violated. It's kind of bad. Um, and then you consider a link, and this is something Fastboot does very well. So a link uh, is just an actual anchor tag. So if a user clicked a link that it can see, that, they, it, 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 that he or she can see, uh, it will go all the way back to the server and will start the process over. So links actually work really well. So depending on what type of data you're working with, you can get pretty far with this kind of strategy. Um, so yeah, those are, the, those are the things I wanted to talk about. And then, and then there's some mitigating strategies on like, how you might make this feel better. So when you're in uh, node land, so the Fastboot server runs in node. When you're in node land, you have an opportunity to basically say, uh, to build your application such that it knows like the templates, your, your HBS, your handlebars templates, they know when they're in node. And you can say, hey, if I'm in node, I don't want you to, uh, or I, I don't want you to allow user input. So we can set disabled flags on things. Um, alternatively, because, well, I don't know how deep you want to get into this. How, how nerdy are you guys? How are you guys feeling this? Are you? Okay. So there's a there's another kind of strategy you can do where, uh, say, you want a form to work. Well, forms work. They just work. Progressive enhancement is a thing. You can actually have a form that literally posts back to your route. You implement the API endpoint. You can do that, and you'll say, hey, when I'm in Node, I want you to send a form that's written in pure HTML. It'll work. And when Ember kicks in, that flag switches, and you turn it back over to Ember. And that could work. There are considerations to that, too. So that's kind of like one of the mitigating strategies. Um, disabling inputs. Uh, there's another concept of queuing user, user actions, um, where you might want to like, keep all of the actions the user can do while Ember is loading, and then play them back at some sort of rate, like allow certain interactions to continue through. Uh, I, I think that's a bad strategy, but it is a strategy. Um, yes, yes, agreed. And you, can, and you can do that. You can actually send kind of any amount of like pre-JavaScript, pre-loaded JavaScript, where it's not part of Ember, but it's small enough to where you can kind of do some stuff. Uh, some script tags in your application template. Yes. Fine. Oh, that, that, would, that would actually. <laughs> I may have done that before. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, so there's a bunch of different strategies, and you can start thinking about, like, when, how, do you, how would you mitigate just knowing that you can have some pre-knowledge of whether or not you're being served in Node or rendered in Node 
or you're in memory in, in a browser, um, like how you might mitigate that. But the problem is that pretty much no matter what you do, you're going to violate some user expect expectations unless you either adequately convey that you are in this intermediary state, uh, which is probably the preferred way, or you need to prevent anything that the user can do that is not going to be able to be reconciled with the booted Ember application. So usually that means disabling any inputs, allowing links to flow through, and you can do some uh, some things with like uh, I don't know what it's called. Like Facebook does it with the little bars. Like you do some like phantom UI where it's like, hey, this is loading, and we have like here's the state of uh, of the UI. This it will be something that you are familiar with eventually. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's kind of like what I'm when I'm talking about CSR and SSR. Those are different things. And uh, I wanted to have a visual here where it was saying like how the user requests it, then it goes to Node, then it goes back to the browser with DOM, the browser parses, and then Ember kicks in once the JavaScript's downloaded and you re-render after clearing the double boot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely yes. Which is why, which is why on really, really low latency, like low memory devices, uh, it's 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 very nice to have uh, like a form, like an HTTP form, because they can download that really quickly. And you know, say it takes 10, 20 seconds to load, they might fill the entire form out before it can render the JavaScript. That's totally fine. And and it's not uh, it's not just the evaluation of Ember. It's when Ember runs the initializer for fast boot, the clear double boot uh, initializer. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So yeah, so that's that's kind of the uncanny valley. And <clears throat> uh -huh. oh, yeah, yeah, yes, correct. Uh, you can, you can, um, you could theoretically, like, yeah. So the proposal is going to fix that problem. Yeah, this is the problem. Yeah. Kind of. It will fix this problem. Yeah. Or it is not done. All right. We we'll have more thoughts on that. Um, yeah, there 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 are things you can do now uh, in current fast food, but yeah, there there is an uncanny valley. And here's the thing that I think uh, is shocking to me when I talk to other people is they think uh, when when we bring up these kind of uncanny valleys that it's an Ember problem, but it's just a server side rendering problem. Um, and and I see a lot of these blog posts, especially when I was researching for this, like writing notes and stuff. Um, there are a lot of like React blogs and Angular blogs where they're like, this is a panacea. You know, you can just do this. Everything's going to work perfectly, but that's not the case. In, in reality, like there's a lot of considerations you have to do to get anything resembling something that's nice. Um, and I think Fastboot strikes a nice balance of like links work. That's good. Content is displayed. It gives you a lot of tools to work with for free, basically. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of my two cents on the matter. Uh, yeah, so the disconnect of SS, uh, I probably should have been clicking the bullets. Uh, consider an input, consider a link. Uh, those are some of the considerations. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is a stock um, keynote presentation slide deck. So, um, so yeah, so these are some of the mitigation strategies. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the last one I wanted to talk about is like what we have now, and that's mostly around like we have some tools, some configuration that we can uh, access via Fastboot, the things included with Fastboot, including template variables, like there's a Fastboot service. Uh, there are add-ons you can like conditionally include in Fastboot or not. Ember CLI will allow you to uh, merge in only Fastboot things into your add-on tree. So you can include things in Fastboot that you don't want to include in your normal payload. And you can do it pretty seamlessly. A lot of the stuff is kind of hidden knowledge. I think the general use case, you like we're still trying to figure out how we want people to approach using this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so when is SSR, uh, in the context of SSR, from what we talked about earlier, once again, not, you know, it's not Rails or PHP or something. Um, sorry, that's not a knock. I don't mean that as a knock. I apologize. Uh, anyways, uh, when is it uh, preferable CPU-constrained devices, uh, memory-constrained devices, uh, train Wi-Fi when you have, like, really shit Wi-Fi? Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a there's a million reasons why you might might why you might want to use uh, fast boot um, or or server side rendering. So I guess that brings me to the question of like what is rehydration? Uh, this is the question that uh, is really important to kind of understand like why we might enable it by default. Um, so if you recall when we talked about it earlier, and once again I wanted to have like a nice uh, 
uh, graphic to describe this. The user makes a request. Uh, DOM is sent from Fastboot, the node uh, server. Um, that is received by the browser. The browser renders the DOM. Uh, and then uh, sometime later, after uh, JavaScript is downloaded, Ember will uh, run an initializer that clears out the, the content. And the problem uh, that that represents is that um, we're throwing away work that was done that was already done on the server. So if we throw away the DOM, it means that now the Ember app has to re-perform all of the steps necessary to get that uh, going. So what rehydration aims to do is it aims to encode enough information into the DOM that is sent down such that the um, like the Ember rendering engine can use those markers to reuse the work rather than have to re-perform it. So uh, basically, rehydration allows us to get rid of the clear double boot instance initializer. It allows us to like not blow away the DOM and instead reconcile the DOM that's sent from Fastboot and just flush it right through. Um, in most cases, there's like a check. Uh, the Glimmer rendering engine does some really fancy stuff, but there's a check and it says, hey, like, if this uh, looks kind of right, I'm just gonna pass it through, and if it's wrong, I'm gonna throw it away. So there's some amount of nodes that would just go right through and just Ember wouldn't have to do any additional work. So it could be potentially much faster. There's also um, uh, some nice things about how it can reconcile some of the stuff that's happening. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, when we're talking about rehydration, we're talking about that, that uh, clear double boot not having to exist and just going straight through. Um, so why is it better? It's better because we're not replicating work. There are already a few tools in Fastboot to try to help with this, um, including a thing called the shoebox. Huh? Did I'm you? Shoebox guy. Yeah, really? I knew you like shoes. I, I, <laughs> I wanted to call it Toe Jam, but Tom was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Uh, sh shoebox is, uh, is, is excellent. It's a way to, um, so typically you, one of the first things that happen in almost any route is you're going to fetch data in a model hook. Uh, and Shoebox allows you to have basically a method to where you can cache that stuff in Node and encode it to the DOM, and then when it gets to Ember side, you can read from that cache rather than make the request again. So instead of requesting it twice like model hook, then we clear the DOM and then we do the model hook again. Instead of hitting your API twice every time, you can just reuse it. So that's already kind of a tool that exists, and this would be used in conjunction with that. Like it wouldn't prevent the need for that. You'd still have to encode it, otherwise the model hooks would fire again. Uh, but it's, it's already kind of a tool that exists. Uh, but rehydration would mean that the DOM itself, once the browser has rendered it, Ember will just like gain knowledge of it by, by looping over it and be able to kind of hook back in to what was happening on the server. And it, it's kind of like, I don't know, like serialized, deserialized operations, but at a browser level, kind of. Um, so it's really about, uh, just avoiding doing extra work. Uh, and how do we implement this? Uh, this is the cool part, and this is like the reason I really like my slide. This is my last slide. Uh, it, uh, it's already done, and <laughs> we just have to merge my RFC, and then it's done. Uh, so if you go to Fastboot and Ember CLI right now, you can turn on a flag called Experimental Serialize Render Mode True. You set it to true in your, in your uh, wherever you're running your node server and uh, it will add rehydration markers to your uh, DOM. So it'll use what's called the serialize element builder, where it serializes the elements uh, to this thing that Ember then with the, uh, oh shit, it's not called the serial, the, the, the one that's in Ember, what's that one called? Rehydrating builder. The rehydrating builder, yeah, it has, its, has the name, yeah, it's in the name. Uh, it's a rehydrating builder. We'll read those, those serialization markers and hook everything up. So you can just use this today. Uh, there is actually a website that if you wanted to right now on your laptops, you can go called Outdoorsy. Uh, David Laird, who is working on the Fastboot team uh, with us on this, um, has already pulled this in and has it deployed on a production site. Uh, so you can see the rehydration markers. They look like little comment nodes with uh, percent signs in them. Um, and I think you actually did all the stuff where it used to be like block colon number or whatever, and now it's like B colon number. So it's even a little more cryptic than it was before, but um, it's smaller, which is important. Uh, so uh, it's really cool, uh, and I think that uh, the, the RFC uh, is really aimed at covering those considerations in the Uncanny Valley that I mentioned the, at the onset of this talk. And um, there are a few things. That I think the, the remaining parts 
that we have left to go with the RFC and some of the remaining questions are, how do we uh, measure how effective the rehydration builder is? So we want to see how many element, how many nodes are, are, are saved or preserved during rehydration. We want that to be easy so that we can get better metrics to improve performance. Um, we need uh, to have a better way to help people not shoot themselves in the foot uh, in terms of disabling input and stuff like that, huh? Yeah, yeah, well, wow, I didn't, wow, God damn it. You know, if I give this again, I'm using that. Uh, so we're, we're just trying to make sure that there uh, are no unexpected rough edges. I think disabling inputs uh, by default and having a, a release valve where you can kind of opt out of that if you wanted to would be the way we go with that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other considerations that we're trying to enumerate in the fast boot meetings. Um, and I'm trying to kind of like codify them in this RFC, but it's a little slow going. So uh, check it out. If you have any feedback or thoughts on Fastboot, um, which I'm sure several of you do, um, reach out to me or reach out to the Fastboot people on the Discord. Uh, there's a Fastboot channel. Um, everyone is pretty responsive. So yeah. And I think that's it. Thank you. There are drafts. It was a draft of a draft. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Right. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, next, walk us through three things that are in a very specific order. This is Kevin Pfefferly. He's going to walk us through angle bracket invocation for built-in components. I can see in his screen. Fn and on. Look at that. And he's got a clicker. Very professional. All right. Kevin Pfefferly. <laughs> so as Matt mentioned, my name's Kevin Pfefferly. Um, I work here at Adapar, but I live in Columbus, Ohio. So I typically work remote. I happen to be here this week visiting on site. So I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm, I'm going to walk us through a few, uh, few RFCs that I've had a chance to play with a little bit. So I'm into them. Uh, First one's RFC 459, uh, deals with angle bracket invocation for built-in components. Uh, this was written by Godfrey Chan. Uh, for anybody who's using, used Ember for any length of time, you're probably familiar with the link to input and text area components, uh, which we've been using with curly braces for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> these are built right into the Ember core framework, so most apps use them unless they explicitly are trying to avoid them for some reason. Um, however, since uh, the mid, since a few versions into the three series, we've started using angle bracket components more often. So uh, these components each have their own challenges uh, with angle brackets, where we couldn't just declare them as angle bracket components and use them the way we used to use them before. Uh, but what we'd ultimately like to be able to do is use link to input and text area as angle brackets. So that's what this RFC proposes and discusses how to uh, manage that transition. So the first one's link to. Uh, link to uh, obviously uses positional arguments as the main API, which is a problem when we're dealing with angle brackets. Uh, so traditionally, we see here like a link to route, and then we can uh, use the block form here to wrap around the content that we want to link. Uh, there also is an inline form which may be even worse, because I literally, for pre presenting this presentation, had to, again, Google which one comes first. Every time. Every time I get it wrong. <laughs> yes. And then I think I got it wrong, and then I switch it, and it's right. Yeah. And yep. It's the worst. So the link to helper is in curly bracket form. It's just bad. It's bad. So what would we like to do instead? So if we're going to use the block form, we can't use positional parameters. So, so instead, what's what the RFC proposed is that we explicitly declare the route argument to the link to component and then pass it a route just like we would have before. <laughs> now, if you're a fan of the inline helper and you love it, <laughs> we're essentially telling you that's a horrible idea. Go use the block form of the helper. 
So the RFC proposes dropping the inline form completely. Uh, if you need to pass a model, we used to be able to do that as a second positional, uh, positional argument. Uh, we now will pass that also as a, main argu as a named argument uh, called model. If it's a singular model, you can use model. If it happens to be multiple models, you can use models and use the array helper to pass more than one model. Uh, input has its own challenges. Uh, internally, uh, the input helper was implemented as several different components that get selected based off on the type argument. So if you call input type text, it renders a text input. If you re call input type checkbox, it renders a checkbox input, which is actually a different input than the text input. Um, this in itself causes some uncertainty and, and has its own challenges for implementation. Uh, so when we're dealing with a text input, uh, it's about exactly what you'd expect here. Uh, the RFC proposes that we keep the same naming structure, we use the angle brackets, and we pass arguments of type and value. And then it works like it did before. For a checkbox input, similar. Type checkbox, name, and the, instead of passing value, we pass checked as a named argument. So the, the transition path here is, is pretty clear. But the RFC proposes that we essentially maintain the mechan same mechanics, just use the new format. I'm not sure if there is a code mod. I know the RFC proposes a code mod. Uh, text area works similarly in that we pass the value. Uh, these, all of these actually happen to be available in the 310 beta at the moment. So they've actually made it into beta at this point. So they're uh, available to use. So it's possible, but it doesn't currently work that way. Okay. You're welcome. I've created more work for you, Robert, because you needed something to do. <laughs> the next RFC I'm going to talk about is RFC 470, which is the FN helper. Uh, this will maybe not seem super useful when we talk about it in isolation, but the next RFC is very closely related and will make it obvious why we want this. Um, for a while, we've had an action modifier, uh, which has, it has some challenges. Um, it does uh, partially apply arguments, which is sometimes referred to as currying. It, bond, it binds the this context. And when it ends up calling send on the action, it does check for uh, both component and controllers. The FN helper is uh, specializes in this partial application of arguments. And when we use the FN helper, uh, if we call FN, pass it a f an action, and then an argument, it is equivalent to if we had written this JavaScript. So it is, it is uh, simply using call to apply the this context, and actually it's maintaining the this context is a more accurate way to describe it and then apply that argument. Yes? I've changed that when I implemented it. You use this and you don't bind it from the outside, we throw it in. Well, this was the approved RFC. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> why do you throw it? See, because this is almost never what you want. Imagine passing FN to on, which he hasn't talked about yet, and then this is the event. Yeah. Or this is like some other form. It's bananas. Yeah. Bananas? <laughs> 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 We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Sorry, sorry. I, I only wanted to call it out yeah, there. Seriously, come on. When implementing, yes. we decided this, this specific thing would have been too trolly because of being bound to event or to some foreign component uh, where you have a this, but it isn't the right thing. Now we just assert if you touch any, like we make this a proxy. And if you touch anything, it throws an error and tells you, what? ah, you should have bound the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you need to pass more than one argument, you continue to use positional uh, 
positionally apply the additional arguments, and they will get tacked on to the end of the call implementation. <clears throat> so according to the FN helper RFC, these would all be equivalent invocations. So some of these may be more familiar to you and then move towards things that might be less familiar depending on your experience with the latest changes in the framework. So we're all very used to calling action, passing a, the name of an action and a parameter. Um, if we're using uh, action decorator, we can pass this dot increment and a parameter. Uh, if you happen to be a fan of the onclick format, which I will attempt to tear down in the next RFC, um, you can do you can pass the same thing to either to either of those to the to the onclick. Uh, we also have, in addition to the. Uh, we also can call action action, which in itself gets a little incepty. Um, <laughs> but then the FN helper essentially allows us to bind these arguments to the function, partially apply them to the function, um, whether we are using on click or the new coming on element modifier, which I will be talking about next. Uh, you can even use it with things like mute, the mute helper. So we can continue to nest these all the way down, helpers all the way down, as deep as you need them. Yep. Uh, this happens to be in Canary. And as of just a few hours ago, it is on by default in Canary. I happen to notice that. This is what I, the benefit of me doing my slides two hours before the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> So RFC 471 is a complementary RFC, and it introduces the on modifier. We already talked about the action uh, modifier a little bit. Um, the action modifier uses a non-standard AST transform to pass this. It blinds to the click event by default, which those uh, experienced Ember developers all understand that implicitly. But people coming to the framework brand new might not understand when they look at a template and see action whatever. They might not understand that that means when you click on that thing. Uh, it also happens to be easy to confuse with the action decorator and the action helper. So we use this name for a whole bunch of things. So the more things we use the same name for, the less clear it is which thing you're talking about. Uh, some people have a preference for on event properties, like on click. Uh, these happen to bind to element properties, so they're not server, they're not SSR or rehydration friendly. Uh, not all events are bindable using this type of a property, and they don't work at all for elements like SVG. Uh, and they're not compatible with standard web components. So there are severe disadvantages to using this, in addition to a number of other things that I'm sure Matt Beal would love to discuss with you, if you really want to get into them. So the proposal from this RFC is to introduce an on modifier, which gives us, uh, allows us to say on, define exactly and clearly which event we're, we're attaching to, pass it an action, and then we can pass additional arguments uh, as needed. So the equivalent JavaScript is, uh, it's the same behavior as adding an event listener in your JavaScript. That you're adding an event listener for a particular event, you're telling it which function to use, and then you can pass it the additional options as needed. Uh, it's also possible with the on modifier to pass multiple modify, multiple uh, actions for multiple uh, JavaScript events. So it's possible to, to pass a handle click action for click and a handle mouse enter action for mouse enter and have that be on the same element in the same template without having to wrap, try to uh, traffic control those things because you're just attaching to different events. Uh, we can use this with the FN helper to pass arguments. So if we want to call add number and pass an argument of one, two, three, uh, we can use that uh, by, by using that FN helper that we just talked about. And uh, in order to, at least according to the RFC, according to the handle to this binding, 
you have to declare with the action um, decorator uh, that action in order for the this context to be properly bound. This feature has also been shipped in Canary. It is hidden behind a feature flag at the moment called Ember Glimmer on modifier. So if you want to use it on Canary, uh, toggle on this feature flag, and it is currently available. Yes? You can also use it with the Ember on modifier uh, add-on, which yes. works back to Ember 2.12. Yes, I was going to mention that, and I forgot. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I've studied these three RFCs, okay. so. Do you have a draft? All right, excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we're going to do a quick uh, five-minute break. Let everyone stand up for a moment. Uh, and then Luke is going to uh, take us back in. And then we're going to have Corey go over a few things. And then we're going to have Robert send us off. Where's the West uh, there's one right around the right corner. If you go yeah. through that door and keep taking laps, you'll run into two of them.
All right, as people wander back, I'm going to take these delicious chocolate eggs. They are an Easter celebration, but everyone can partake in the chocolate eggs. I just want to say, I know someone is eager for a chocolate egg. I'm going to put them near the pizza. And if you're a person who likes pizza and chocolate eggs, then tonight's the night for you. Okay, chocolate exactly. Eggs. Chocolate eggs. All right. Uh, let's give our good friend Luke Melia a, a warm round of applause. Thank you, Matt. Okay, RFC Roundup, number 391 and 457. Which is, which is your favorite number? Um, so the first one uh, is builds on the uh, some of the angle bracket syntax that we saw uh, in Kevin's talk, um, and it addresses the problem that uh, we love angle bracket syntax, and it's been really cool to be able to get to start using it. But you can't use it for your templates that are, your components that are uh, nested in a subdirectory. Um, however. Now that this uh, RFC has been merged, which it has been, um, and it has been um, implemented in the angle bracket invocation um, polyfill, thanks Robert, um, you can now write your, use your nested component. Uh, so if you have a warning component nested under app slash app dash icons, um, and you can use it like you see at the top, app icons colon colon. And so most of the discussion in the uh, RFC is about what should the separator be, <laughs> uh, which is a complicated topic. Um, sadly uh, for Robert, he lost the argument on that one. I, I've never won one, so. <laughs> you wanted slashes. I wanted the thing that's intuitive to every developer ever. I don't know, I wrote Ruby, that was pretty cool. <clears throat> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Yehuda was the champion on this, who also Rubyist. Maybe, maybe there's something that's in there. Um, mm. um, and uh, there is a great video that Sam uh, and Ryan put together, where Sam walks through um, doing some um, refactoring of nested uh, and also non-nested. Um, Angle bracket components to, uh, or, or curly components to, to angle bracket syntax. Um, and I would highly recommend this, um, checking this out. It is, even if you think you know it, I, I feel pretty comfortable with the syntax, but there he points out some interesting nuances. And it's also really great to see kind of the refactoring steps moving from one to the other. Uh, you can use this today. Robert's Ember angle bracket invocation polyfill goes back to probably 210. <laughs> um, so that's that one. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. It's merged. It's going to be in 310. What do you think of the separator? That's fine with me. I, I, uh, yeah, I don't feel too religious about these things. <clears throat> Spaces. Come on. Them. Come on. <laughs> um, the next RFC that I'm covering is router. Oh, is router helpers? Yep. And uh, router helpers is um, also has a tie into Kevin's uh, talk, which we're, because the link to um, helper, which we've all our component, which we've all used, um, you may have looked at the docs for this at some point. Um, and there are quite substantial document docs for it because it is very powerful. It does many things. It does many things that I was not aware of after doing Ember for seven years. Um, one of the things that it does, you, um, I'm curious if anybody else in the room uh, was aware of this. You can, I'll do a quick poll after. Um, when you uh, are click, one, click a link to component and you are transitioning into the next route, um, it adds a class, CSS class to the component ember dash transitioning in. Um, and when you're leaving, it's ember dash transitioning out. Uh, bit curious by show of hands, who knew that? 
Okay, cool. All right, all right. The good stuff. Um, I, I feel very fortunate that I made it this far without having to learn that. <laughs> um, and so what the router helpers RFC uh, contemplates is saying, let's take, this, let's take all of this logic that's kind of tied up into this one component and let's break it down into helpers so that you can build your own link to behavior um, if you want to. And so uh, what you see up on the screen are the, the specific helpers that are um, contemplated for this RFC. Um, URL 4 is probably the most straightforward. Generate a URL, given the same inputs that you would give to a, uh, to a link to component. So the route is the first argument, the model, and then a query params. Um, I really love how these are um, ordered positional parameters. <laughs> um, trolling. Uh, although I don't, I don't mind it, but I am trolling. Um, there are, I believe, um, in RFC uh, contemplates options for um, using names for these as well. Yep. Um, root URL uh, is what it sounds like. Um, root URL for the app. Um, is active, is loading, is transitioning in, and is transitioning out. Um, are helpers that produce the Boolean value that you uh, could use to display the CSS classes that link to automatically gets on, on it. Um, and so obviously what's really nice about these things being broken down is that you can use them, just the things you need. You don't pay the price for all the things that you don't need. Um, and if, by the way, you have ever in Ember um, rendered many link to's on a page, um, you may have been surprised to find out that this is very slow. Um, and so this, is, this will uh, be much faster, I understand from my conversation a few minutes ago with Chad and Robert, um, not just because you're using less, but because each of these things actually will be able to use um, the template layers kind of invalidation as opposed to having to do um, computed and observery things inside of the link component definition. Um, let's see what else I have. Oh, so uh, the RFC talks about migrating from one to the other. Um, and so this is an example of kind of a simple case where instead of using link to, you can use a, a tag with an href attribute and dynamically set the href attribute to um, the result of the URL for helper. Uh, there, the RFC also contemplates um, that there could be a, uh, what is it called, code mod, written to do this translation for you. Uh, what's interesting about that is that um, it's difficult, would be difficult for code mod to know which CSS classes you're using. And so uh, if it were to do a kind of full migration, it may not be desirable because it would look like <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, so we probably don't want that. Um, Matt, sure. Hmm, interesting. I, I mean, just don't use those. That's <laughs> <laughs> a good reason not to. Um, the status of this RFC is that it is uh, merged and has not yet been worked, not, there's no implementation as yet. Um, it is uh, backed up a little bit behind the router service RFC, which is going to implement features that uh, the, these things will, will use, these, these helpers will use um, to facilitate their behavior. Um, you can use it today-ish um, by using Robert's Ember router helpers. Um, this is an imperfect implementation of a lot of the ideas that I just went through. Um, however, it's probably, in many cases, more perfect than using link to. Um, so worth checking out. Any questions about this one? All right. 
that's oh sure, Jonathan. Href2. So yeah, Intercom has an Href2 add-on, um, which is a lighter weight and faster version of Link2. It does less. Uh, one thing to call out. Yeah. Uh, the fact that one of your slides sh showed this, but you can use it in Href equals. Mm -hmm. That also necessarily means that there's a global listener for any uh, like transition of links, uh, and that you can just have other constants that have links, and they will also uh, if routing was in the Ember app, they'll just use an internal transition instead of the full page unit that you have before. So if you do this today, mm. if anything was event listening, then you would do a full page reload. Ah. So there's a, there's a uh, on the yeah, page. HREF2, that's what John yeah. was talking about. But my point is it's important to call out because mm -hmm. you can imagine taking like a CMS that has Markdown or something and now you might be linking to internal things that today would have to do lots of hoop jumping to avoid. That's a good point. Does, does, Ember, does Ember router helpers also support that? Uh, yes. Sweet. Um, cool. And you can lift some code from HREF2, <laughs> as, as is the tradi great tradition of open source. Um, any other uh, questions or thoughts? Does the RFC propose this becoming the, like, default standard? The, the RFC says, let's uh, deprecate Link2 in a different RFC. The RFC doesn't take a position on it, but <laughs> yes. Yes. Even if I want deprecation. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine. But for new web developers, developers, we would teach them. Maybe. Possibly. There'll be an RFC <laughs> to talk about it. I, yeah. I like Link2, the Angle Back Invocation Style, the Val and Model. If it were to de sugar into just doing basically what's on the slide right here, where you just have your own form, that's it. Um, but I, this is really, to really difficult. Yeah, to me, this is a much better, uh, a much better teaching thing than yes, link than I, link to. I mean, sure. everybody knows what this means by looking at it. The, the, the problem is when you like if you go two slides forward or something. Uh, yeah, this slide. Uh, if you happen to want to do an active class and the URL, like it sucks to have to replicate all the stuff. This isn't even exactly like one to one though, right? Because there is that model caching thing that we mentioned earlier. Like, if you pass a primitive object to the model, it would it would do sure. it would not ever hit sure, the model. Sure, but each of the point is, each of the helpers take the same arguments. So if you want to use multiple of them in the same element, you just have to repeat yeah, the yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. three times. Yeah, yeah. And that sucks. Mm. Uh, Ember router helpers provide the solution by basically having a helper that you can use with let or with. Uh, it's like route info, and it yields the thing that you have, like, you know, whatever you need in block param dot URL and dot is active and dot, like, is loading, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think the RFC, this RFC goes through and does that, but that's. You could imagine a helper, whether in user land or uh, or in part of one of these that that is like link classes, and it does all these things for you in one. Also, if you wanted to be succinct and lazy, yeah. All right, cool. That's it for me. Hot on Luke's heels, we have Corey Forsyth. He's not using Linux on the desktop, so his slides are already up. So a warm round of applause for Corey Forsyth. OK. Uh, all right, the RFC I have is number 460, yieldable named blocks. Yeah. Its current status is that it was merged two days ago. It's the most recently merged RFC. No, no, it is the most recently merged RFC of any that ah, exists, okay, okay. yes. And also of the ones that also cover the same topic, uh, <laughs> which, is another, which is a slide I have, yes. 
Uh, yeah, it was uh, written by Yehuda. And uh, yeah, the history, there's a long history of this concept. Uh, the first RFC, or no, not, not even the first, but the most recent like merged RFC, I think, that addressed this idea of named yieldable things. It was written by Alex Matcher, number 226, merged uh, two years ago. And this RFC is an amendment to that one to finalize the syntax, like just sort of scope it down into something I think that can land maybe less controversially or at least more has a clearer path to landing and sort of being used without trying to do too many things at once. But there are a bunch of other RFCs. Um, I don't think the other ones were merged that address this concept. Uh, part of the challenge made with those is that they were trying to do, do everything and at a time when the syntax of Ember itself was changing from curly braces to angle bracket invocation. And so uh, trying to come up with a new syntax and then uh, shoehorn it into both of those things I think was hard and prevented some of those other RFCs from really getting the traction that this one has had. Uh, I lifted this from the intro to 226, the first um, named or like block RFC. Uh, you can sort of scan it there, but I thought Alex did a really good job of uh, very verbosely expressing mm -hmm. the the power. Like I, I think of named blocks as a little bit as like a missing feature of Ember because we have this great concept of the composition of being able to yield, but we only have a way to yield one thing, and the rest you just have to find a way to sort of work around. Uh, example use case, this is from the RFC, is you have this article component with a title and a body. If you want to, and, and as the author, you want to yield that body slot so that um, in user land, people who use the component can, can give their own body DOM. Um, but the problem is, what if you also want to allow a similar customization of the title? And what you might do today is you would just take a title property and use that to render. But um, that's not great if you want to allow people to pass in arbitrary DOM to you for both of those places. The solution is, is this RFC, 460. Uh, this is what it looks like, uh, ba the basic usage. On the left in, in user land, if you're, if you're using it, someone has written a component for you to use, you invoke it with angle bracket style, and then the slots are uh, named with this colon title. So if you like the colons from the first RFC that Luke showed, you've got more of them now. Um, <laughs> And then otherwise, it sort of looks like HTML, where you have a wrapping tag. Yes? How does that be yielding? Uh, like, uh, I guess I'm, I'm seeing you before and after, but I'm not necessarily. No, no. no. Like, this is how you pass. The left is passing. The right is, is using the pass. Ah, OK. I see. Got it. Yeah. Okay. I would, the left side is invoking the article component, passing in some name. Block. Yeah. You are a user of this component here if you are the author of the component. The implementation is how you do it and, and name those slots there, yeah. Um, and it also allows you to pass uh, uh, parameters, uh, like yield parameters, and, and that looks like you would expect. You can do as, and then you take positional arguments here, and then uh, ditto for the implementation side. You yield them positionally, and they just sort of land in these slots here. Hmm? Uh, some other notes about this. Uh, this RFC, I mentioned it, it limits the scope just to angle bracket invocation only. Um, there are some other tools that you can use, like Hasblock and Hasblock params, to figure out when you write the uh, template for the component itself, how you can have sensible defaults for some of these things. And then there are a few things that are called out in the RFC that are coming later, uh, such as how to maybe pass down those blocks if you want to have nested components and, and keep threading the data down or the block down. Um, and then another concept of unified rendering was in the original 226 RFC and was sort of elided from this one. But that's the idea of uh, just standardizing so that everything that looks the same renders is, takes the same render path. Um, so yeah, I, I, I was heard that there was going to be a Marvel theme to this slide, <laughs> to this, this talk, and I, I'm the only one so far. But I, I went and I searched for, I thought about what attributes um, this RFC would have if it were a, a hero. <laughs> and I went and I, and I Googled and I found Swarm, who has the ability to shape shift and intangibility. And, al and also, this is from the website, the ability to mentally manipulate the bees that compose this body. So that's what I think about when I think about named blocks. Yes. I don't know about you. All right, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Like this implementation is basically done. We just need to update the boomer VM. So, um, just. Hmm. 
updates the Glimmer VM in Ember. So, the, 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 so there are tests that exist in Glimmer VM that test the exact configuration. Ember is not just a Ember. The upgrade itself has other issues that are unbroke by me. But uh, <laughs> thanks, Jim. That's right there. Yeah, Alex? That's the, the main block, yep. Not render, yeah. Uh, it, I don't think it was specified. I think that's true too. Exactly. If you read the RC, I had a couple of comments back and forth from Yehuda that were, uh, uh, what you want people to do is test for the block, if you can do the test for the block. block, yeah. 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 So you have the block. Can ask, ask for the name of the block, like the has you have a title for it. Yeah, yeah, the has block takes a single param, which is the name of the block. So has invert, has main, has title, has whatever. So you, but again, you don't necessarily want to always Wait, do that. Wait, invert is like Inside the template, <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. So, so is the threading true though? Is the, since the since the concept of like passing data down now is just like the hat thing, would it be cat colon no. template? So the, so the syntax for passing that Alex's, that would, I think Alex's RFC. Yeah. Colon by. As of right now, you cannot pass a name that's block that's that passes the utility block. Uh, this one? Yeah. So that's yeah. The, the, the bit. Right. So yes. Yeah, with, with Yep. We want to, we want to do it. Yeah, it, there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a speculative idea in the RFC, but yeah. We want to let you pass them to them. The, the problem is basically garbage collection. It's really hard. Turns out. Turns out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you explicitly shocker, then you've got to figure out when you call the thing because you basically never, because you don't know when that thing is going to be and when you call it. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, uh, at least as of this RFC being implemented, you could pass article, blah, 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 hat header, as well as have a block name header if you want to. It, it is RFC. allowed. Right. If you read, this There's is no exactly the scenario. <laughs> this is exactly the scenario I called out in my first comment uh, because I think that it's not great. However, existing component authors will need to rely on, like, imagine a thing like Power Select. It takes closure. Kind of like the original reason why this RFC existed is that the 
originally the the idea was that you would say like app header as title, but now that was supposed to be an argument into the actual component. But the whole like app name is like if it's in the actual invocation, then you're saying like these are arguments into it, and then they're used on the inside, like on the implementation as at article. And so you we create an ambiguity between the the actual definition and the actual usage of the actual app art. So this is why like colon XML namespace header uh, is actually needed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it should be a link. Yeah, it shouldn't have both an app header and an app. Yeah. Okay, uh, Corey, for those on the street, can you summarize? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have an old laptop. Oh, you mean I have a laptop that actually has the right cabling <laughs> built in. Built in support. Okay, and uh, wrapping us up here is Robert Jackson, whom many of you know. Robert, I told him we'd be out of here by 9.30. Yeah. So, yeah. You got that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, please give Robert Jackson a. You see how this is going to be. I was joking, but this looks like the rest of the RFC. Hello. I only took four. You guys, other people took like three or four also. I thought they were related. I was a little upset someone took the uh, FN and ON ones, but, you know. Less than one? How, how do you get less than I one? Draft I see. So it doesn't count. Uh, all right. So there is a little bit of precursor to most of my talks. You probably, anybody that has seen them or heard me speak before ha are aware. But uh, this will go much better and more entertaining for you if you troll me while I'm speaking. Uh, feel free to shout out, not obscenities per se, but questions or... Uh, comments as we go. Uh, all right, so uh, real quick, uh, this is me. Uh, I, ac I accidentally picked this apron, but I was not going to put it back um, because I'm a princess. Seems good. Uh, so I, I'm on the Ember core team. I'm also on a number of other Ember-related teams, uh, data, CLI. Um, I'm not allowed to join anymore, apparently. So uh, I have an open source problem. Uh, I did some quick NPM stats. Uh, the packages that I actively maintain have had more than 15 million downloads in the last 30 days. Um, so yeah, that's problematic. Uh, and I work at LinkedIn. Um, and for like the first time in many, many, many years, I am actually quite happy at work. Uh, I work with an awesome team. I work on awesome things. And uh, you should come talk to me or Chad if you are curious how that feels. Um, so before, before we jump into details, I always like to shout out and thanks to my family. Uh, my wife and my, my kids are home probably asleep, which is probably where I'd be as well. Um, but uh, I only can do the things that I do because uh, they help me and support me. And uh, most of the time, speakers don't talk about like actual lives outside of code. And I think that that's quite important. So uh, thanks to my family. All right. So, uh, so there's a few RFCs that I'm going to talk about. I think four. We'll see how many I get through. Uh, Matt has uh, stacked the deck against me. So we'll see. Um, the, uh, I try to arrange them in order of. Uh, 
the ones that would be the easiest to explain on their own, and then the later ones build on the concepts introduced in the, in the earlier ones. But we'll see how I do. Uh, all right, so track properties. Um, so for folks that have been in and around the Ember space for a while, this should look pretty familiar. Um, you have a computer property, it's called name, you list the dependent keys, and you have, uh, you know, you just read your values first and last. I guess the, the, there's a slight new thing, which is that you don't have to use this.get uh, first and this.get last. Um, that came around, ooh, 3.1 or 3.2 time frame, but uh, it's been a little while now. But, uh, but uh, that, that's a, that was a very nice addition. I am very ha happy for that. Um, but, uh, but other than that, it looks pretty stock Ember stuff. So, so what I'm going to do, I've got a couple of slides. They'll be quick. But the idea here is to dig into what, how could this example be translated into using tracked um, properties, and what does that look like, and what are some of the caveats and downsides that you might run into. Um, so there's lots of stuff in the weeds. So please, if something doesn't make sense, uh, call it out and ask me. Uh, all right, so the first thing is, um, you're probably expecting me to talk about decorators, and I probably will. But right away, the first thing I want to talk about is just using um, a, the, the form that works in ember.object. Uh, you can use this without transforming to decorators or adding any special babble processing or any of that stuff. Um, the idea here is if you look between the two examples, this is a computed, and the computed is dynamic, um, and it just builds off the two values. In the tracked case, what you're doing is you're saying the leaves, the, the leaves, sorry, the, the, the raw data is marked as tracked, um, and anything uh, you do otherwise could just be a regular getter, and it's just normal JavaScript, and it looks quite lovely if you ask me. Um, which you didn't, because you're not doing a good job of your job. But uh, yeah, so, uh, so this is the first thing. It's a little bit annoying to write like this cur like, uh, tracked open paren curly value thing. Um, so you can also do this. Um, this works. This is part of Octane. Except apparently there is a smart quote in there, which is totally evil. Uh, but whatever. Uh, I, did, I, I was going to say I didn't do it, but I probably did. But you know. Um, but the, the idea here is there is a decorator. Uh, you can mark, uh, you mark, mark fields as tracked. Um, and then you can even initialize them. It's quite, uh, quite nice looking, in my opinion. Uh, what this does is sets up uh, track property for first and last. And um, I don't show any examples where you can assign, but the, 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 the way this works is you can just assign it like normal JavaScript. You can say this.first equals some new value. You don't have to use this.set. You don't have to use notify property change. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Um, and the templates properly re-render, and uh, all is well in the world. Um, Uh, so there was actually, uh, so the question is, should you put your decorators the way I've displayed them or not? I obviously think you should put them exactly how I do them. However, um, I think that uh, it is, uh, so Prettier made a choice, then they rolled back their choice. So they, pre they originally chose, the first time they enforced anything was decorator on a separate line from the implementation. Then they subsequently changed it to be, um, you have to have them in groups. So if you do them on one line, that is okay. But uh, you can't intersperse uh, one-liners and two-liners, basically. Um, so this, this, I think, looks quite nice. I think, I think basically the answer is there's heuristics, and we'll get some good lint rules. Um, I think, for example, if there were, these were functions, you would probably want them on a separate line. I, I don't have any, oh, I think I have one example of that in, this, in the deck. But you, you want the decorator and then like get space something. Or like if it was a computer property, you might want uh, at computed and then get space the thing instead of putting it on the same line that looks a little bit to me a little bit weird. Um, also, if there's multiple decorators, I personally find it difficult to parse on a single line. Like you'd want to see like maybe at computed and then at like read only or something. I don't know what what other you, thing you might stack, but they stack, so um, you, you would do that. Um, I think, for example, things like Ember Data, where you have attributes, so you might do at adder space the name of your prop in the semicolon. I think that looks great. I think there, that's that's how you should do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. That basically, a decorator accepts a descriptor, um, and since a decorator emits a descriptor, uh, they basically pipe together in a way that makes sense. 
Yes, Ali. I mean, hopefully it errors. I don't know. Ho hopefully it errors, but it probably doesn't. We should file an issue to check. What version of the decorator specter are you talking about? Yeah, good, good question. So initially, the, the initial RFC proposed using the stage two decorator spec at the time that it was proposed. Um, unfortunately, stage one, stage two, stage whatever don't actually make a ton of sense, but. Um, All of them so far have allowed in, uh, multiple decorators, e including the current proposal, the static decorator spec. Yes, Ali. Uh, say more. I, I'm going to say yes, they can, uh, but it's up to the decorator author to figure it out, and that's not me. Uh, pr probably you get a descriptor that is marked as writable and you would have to throw or something. Like if it's already marked as writable and maybe it's frozen or something, there's probably a way to do it. I, I don't know for sure, but I believe that that scenario makes sense. You'd want to err in that case. Um, so, but to Matt's question, Matt asks what spec, what uh, decorator spec are we implementing? Um, we initially proposed, the RFC proposed implementing stage two decorators because at the time when we proposed it, we believed the stage two would advance to stage three. Um, uh, that like within a couple of weeks, that did not happen. Um, and we sort of went back to the drawing board with decorators. So, uh, so what we did in the meantime was uh, we went back to stage one decorators, which is widely supported and used by many people um, in and out of Ember community. Um, it's used by things like MobX, uh, TypeScript, Angular stuff by way of TypeScript, um, and a number of other React libraries. So it's basically much better supported. Stage one decorator spec is much better supported than stage two. Anyways, um, there is a complete revamp of the decorator spec uh, to address the reasons why it was essentially rejected for stage three. Um, and I personally quite like it, but that is far outside the scope of this conversation. Uh, all right, so, uh, so there's a few things. So I'm, I'm showing in this uh, example, uh, you go from uh, computed, uh, if you're going to tra traverse from computed to using tracked properties, the idea is instead of marking the thing that is itself dependent on other properties, you're marking the things that are the, the data that you plan to consume. So in this case, in the computed case, you're marking, hey, I depend on first and last. So you're marking the things you care about changing. But in the tracked case, you're marking the things that are data to be consumed by other things, right? So, so it's sort of a fundamental difference. Now, one thing that we realized as we went through this um, and through the implementation, we realized that track properties that are inherently, uh, so we originally proposed that computed properties would automatically track the things that they access. Um, unfortunately, that cha necessarily changed the caching semantics of Ember Computed and that was very trolly to users in reality. Like we, we actually tested it, we implemented it, tested it in a number of apps, they failed in ways that were very non-obvious and should not have failed. Like, it just enabling the flag should not have caused your app to crash, uh, and that was what was happening. So, uh, so we went back to the, not to the drawing board, but we went back and reevaluated the idea of forcing ember.computed to auto opt in to the new world, um, and decided that it should just stay, stay the way it is. You can have your dependent keys, that's how the caching works, and that's fine. Um, but if you still want to migrate to tracked, which you probably should because it's a nicer mental model, but have things that, went, that you want to transform from computed like this to just regular getters, like uh, too many, um, you can mark your getters as watchable. Now this, um, this is still an open active RFC. It's in final comment period, so please comment if you dislike. However, um, the point is this is a transitionary thing. So if you transition something from being a CP to being something that is derived from track state, you need a way to tell the rest of the system, hey, you should depend on these track things as your dependent keys. Um, and it should be notified, if you will, in, in older parlance. It should be notified when things change. Um, so we went through many names. Uh, I am not a terrible fan of this one, uh, but I am very much opposed to many of the others. So uh, if you can think of a better name that isn't like observable, uh, or something like that, because that means a different thing, um, then I'm all ears. So the, re the reason this would need to exist is if I want to have another CP that depends on me? Yes. So, so, for so the, the 
uh, Luke's question was, the reason this watchable thing needs to exist is because if you have other CPs that depend on this getter, not this now getter, was a CP, but now is a getter. So the, the specific scenario is, imagine, so, sorry, let me back up for a second. In most, this is a simple class example, but in most cases, like in a computed property, only thing that's consuming the getters are going to be the template, and that will work fine. Um, you don't need watchable in that case. You only need watchable in the case where uh, you might be defining a service, which is then potentially has many consumers, one of which might be a computer property or an observer, God forbid. Uh, and you need, you need to know that thing is going to invalidate when it's changed. So again, watchable is expected to be a, a self-expiring feature. Um, so as those things go away and as people migrate to Tract, we expect you to use watchable less and less. Say that again. If you're passing name into a component. Like as an argu argument to a component, OK? And inside the component, you're computing something on the No. Declare... No, because that's just, that, that's like template data flow. Once it goes to the template. Yeah, yes. Sorry. So it doesn't turn it into computed. So, so let, me, let me try to say it a different way. Um, if a computed property or an observer depends on a thing that is not either another computed property or observer or a track property or a watch pro watchable property, it will throw an error. So yes, if you have a computer that depends on another one of these, a native getter, there's no way for the system, the programming system, sorry, the programming model to know when that ch changes. You cannot use tracked on getters. Tracked only goes on data. Right, right. But if it's a problem, it's a but yeah. Model, yeah. So the, the reason I did that is because if you, um, again, this is a simplified example, mostly to fit on a slide, but imagine name is used by a CP. Maybe this is a service, like oh, the current user service or something. If name is consumed by something else, then you need watchable so that that thing can know when to invalidate. So basically, if if a property is dependent on by anything else in the JavaScript space, it's like a CP, an observer, I don't know, array observers, proxies or something, I don't know, stuff like that, then you'll need watchable. Yes, yes. Yes, Chad. Please, Zelgo me. Ch changeable, seems good. I, would, uh, I will... I will try to remember to comment, but you should also feel free to comment. Um, we are, we are, it, the, the semantics are very important. The name is terribly not important, but we have to pick something. So, like, I don't know what that means. Put JS in the name? No, that's weird. It would be very no, no, no. Yeah. That seems fine. I, I, the, 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 we, we, do not, we, we do not, we do not want to make it feel good. We don't want to make it seem like a thing you want to leave permanently. It is absolutely a thing that things like add-on authors um, that provide services or routes or controllers uh, would have to do. But if you're authoring components only, mostly you're only concerned about your component and its template, and that doesn't need watchable. Yes. No, you cannot, no. I mean, I, I mean, you could figure out how to do that, but don't. Yes. It, no, it's not, no, hold on, it, it, hold on, it's not watched until someone watches it. At, at Schrodinger's cat. Uh, because in, in the very long term, we expect people to migrate away from computed properties and observers completely to only using tracked, and then you would never need watchable. But in this case, where we have the only reason watchable is used is because we expect someone outside of this class, this person class, to depend on name. If that isn't true, sorry, to depend on name by, from a computed property or observer. So if you don't have any computed properties or observers in the entire system, you don't need watchable at all. 
I, now, now we're together. Now, we're, now you're with me. Yes. You mean if you didn't have watchable? Yeah, right. Yes, the proposal is that it would throw an error. Because otherwise, it, it would be too hard to find. Okay. And, then you're, okay. so error and then you add watchable. Yes, that's the idea. Yes. Uh, the, alternatively, like if you are a, uh, uh, an author of an add-on or a shared service, and you want to migrate to using Tract, and you migrate a thing that isn't computed to using Tract, and you expect that computed property or that, that function, or sorry, that, that, that value to be dependent on by external people, like that's your public API, then you, you probably would proactively add watchable because you expect that to be consumed. Yeah, exactly. Yes? Uh, sure. Like consumable seems OK. I, I, I think, um, so, so personal, per personal. So this isn't final comment period. It's very close to the end of the final comment period. So you should comment. Um, I think the, the, point, the, the point is that it's very important that we have the semantics here. But again, the name is not terribly important. And I think because it's going away, we don't want to pick a really prime time name that is good for long term stuff, right? So a long name that's descriptive seems fine to me personally. It, the dominant use, uh, yes. But also, but also internal systems, like if you're so, like you have an app, it's big. It, you, But you can't, you know, you need to be able to migrate parts at a time. You need to be able to migrate pieces at a time. Yes. But you need to be able to migrate parts of the system to get, like, like you have a big app. You can't just, like, snap my fingers and a magic genie comes and fixes my app. Like, if that worked, then, like, we'd all be out of jobs. And maybe happier. Anyways, uh, yes. So there is a code mod that uh, transforms from Ember Object Extend to native classes, but it still uses computed property. There is not currently a code mod to transform com from computed to tracked. Uh, yes, but the, the, I agree we can author, we can write a code mod that can be using, use runtime assisted code mod technology like Die Factor or something to determine what's going on in the system. The problem is sometimes the thing you're tracking is passed into you, like if it's a component. Like it's not clear that it's your own originated data, so sometimes it's a little, little bit diff difficult, especially in computer properties that have paths. So you don't know where like .foo.bar.baz comes from. It's hard for you to go and like statically analyze what is going to be foo.bar.baz, or sorry, foo.bar, to go and add at tract to baz, right? Yeah, you, you could code mod the simple case. You could code mod the case that I showed, for sure. Like, it's local state, it was defined. I can totally, you can totally code mod that. The, the, the problem is the code mod falls down, like, it, because it's hard to statically analyze the broader system knowledge case. People do it? Uh, no, only the leaf. Only Baz in that case. On bar, bar would mark Baz as at tract and it would just work. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, that seems good um, to me. Um, it, it, the, the, the reason we did intentionally choose names that were not matched because they aren't the same thing. So um, there was a much earlier proposal for track that w would be put on, on getters and setters and stuff. Um, in this case, track adds a setter that when you assign it, it changes, it notifies the rest of the system and automatically updates, but watchable does not. You can't set a watchable thing. It's only retrievable. Um, you're, you're expected to set the underlying state, whatever is being watched, but not the watchable. Um, but uh, I, I do, ex I agree, externally tracked or externally observed or, well, not observed, because observed has negative ramifications, but anyways, yes, that externally something makes sense, more sense to me than, than this as well. But uh, the window is closing. You should comment on the RFC. 
Feel free to tell them now, but I'm going to keep going. All right. So that's it on tracked. So you all got it. You can go and write your track stuff now. Um, as far as implementation status, it is behind a feature flag on Canary. It is very, 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 very difficult to polyfill. I will do it uh, once we have figured out the, the caveats that we're still working through. Like, the RFC, like we did the thing. We determined there was bugs, and we had to go back and redesign, do some design work. It does, uh, it's hard to do a polyfill. You should not do a polyfill before you have finalized design. So. Um, but it's quite hard to do because it affects literally all the infrastructure for like computer properties and the template tracking and everything. It's very hard. It's very hard. <laughs> um, so uh, element modifiers. So I was hoping I was going to go first, but Matt totally gave me the shaft here um, because I was going to. I'm going to intro element modifiers because y'all don't know what those are. So as a concept. Element modifiers are things you use in element space. Um, so you're familiar, uh, especially from Kevin's uh, uh, presentation, but you're familiar with action. Uh, action is commonly a thing that you use in element space. If you have been doing Ember a long time, you also are familiar with a thing called bind adder. Uh, that's putting your Wayback hats on. Um, and uh, that was also a quote unquote modifier. Um, but you can imagine a modifier is just anything that you can author that you want to put in element space. In this case, this is from the RFC. It's like, ah, maybe you want to call performance.mark with this argument. You know, there you go. Um, some other examples. Um, at the time, I uh, originally wrote this so slide, which was not today. Um, this was only available in add-on. Now it's available behind Canary. Uh, Kevin presented on it. Uh, this is on. Um, so there's another uh, set of add-ons that provide nice user APIs to author your own modifiers. Um, this is a case of, uh, I think, Ember OO modifiers, which is a nice little add-on that has got a pretty good test suite. And it lets you author uh, sort of plain classes uh, that extend the base modifier class. And um, you have some hooks, like did receive arguments and did update arguments, that kind of thing. Um, and you get the you have the element assigned on your instance, and you can do things with it. Um, so this is how that scroll top, this is just setting scroll top on the element, and this, this is how you might invoke it. Um, so this is a really awesome add-on called Ember Functional Modifiers, which is effectively light, like uh, the hooks stuff in React, um, where you have a modifier that accepts an element, and it's expected to return a function that does the cleanup, um, uh, the, the, the destruction, teardown, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, I mean, this is obviously a very silly example. Uh, why would you want to randomly move a thing around? But um, you know, that's how you could use it. Uh, I was just showing the API. Um, so OK, now we're getting serious. So this is the actual RFC that I'm supposed to present on. Um, but I assumed you didn't know what uh, modifiers were so now uh, now you know um, so there the the ember render modifiers uh, add-on provides three different modifiers did insert will destroy and did update uh, I did not include did update in this slide but you know just imagine it exists um, so you pass them a function the function is expected to have already been bound so same as fn or on uh, the whole suite of things expects uh, the function you pass it to, if it needs it in this context, to have been bound before. Um, so that would be with the at action decorator um, in mo like commonly. Um, so the idea here is when this div is inserted, um, you call setup popper. And when it's destroyed, you call teardown popper. Now, um, you might wonder, why do I care? Um, and the answer is, if you've ever written code in your div insert element that uses like this dot dollar and then adds a query selector, uh, or this that element that query selector, um, and then you do something on the child and expect that thing to exist, you have probably introduced a bug where if that thing was guarded in a conditional and the conditional is false, uh, it doesn't exist. Um, that's a really common case, and it's quite easy to, um, to mess up. Uh, so for example, if you want to set up some jQuery plugin or some normal plain, quote unquote, plain DOM plugin, and um, but you only do it conditionally, or it's on some nested element or something. Um, 
oftentimes you can't rely on the fact that it's present in both your did insert element and will destroy element. You have to do some extra shenanigans to figure out, um, oh, well, uh, it's removed and now tear it down. But if you tear it down and it's not in the DOM, it gives yeah, you shit like fits. Like yeah, like in this example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you have so m most likely there is a bug unless you tried really hard. If you did that, would that be a memory? Uh, it could be. It depends on what you set up. If you set up like a the jQuery, it's gonna get gone. Yeah, it's it's gone. Yeah. But the jQuery plugin, for example, is still around or still trying to exist, yeah. right? But it's a really common bug, like very, very, very common. Okay, cool. um, so, uh, anyways, the idea here is these element modifiers you can put them on any DOM element, and when the, the rendering engine inserts or removes the elements, it's going to call these hooks for you automatically, and you can remove this whole class of bug. Um, and honestly, in my opinion, have a much more declarative API from the template perspective of what's actually going on. Um, instead of having to do some kind of gnarly code in your JS to go dig in to find specific elements, you can just have uh, your functions directly invoked with the element. Yes, the, yeah, yes. Yes, the first argument to these are the element, yes. Sorry, I did not call that out. Um, so, uh, did insert and will destroy seem pretty simple. It's like when the thing is inserted, it's gonna call, the function is only ever called once. Did update is called many times. Um, whenever the arguments to did update are updated is when it's called. It is not called whenever the element itself is like new attributes or attribute values change. So it's a, a thing that folks have been confused about. Um, and you know we can we can rejigger that if we need to, but uh, the the implementation is that if you pass additional args to will update, that's what invalidates your thing. Like maybe the function changed or the args changed. Yes. Please hold. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't have a specific slide for it, but uh, all of these take additional arguments. You can say, like, at foo, like, set up popper, at foo, at bar, or this.foo. You can pass it in stuff. It's going to get the element and then the function, the arguments you give it. Did update only invalidates when the other arguments you pass it have changed. So, for example, if you want to do different, th like, if you want to set up a DOM widget, um, based on like options are passed to you and you need to set it up and tear it down when someone changes the option, like they want to set a width or whatever stuff it does, um, then you would pass those options into that did update call and it's gonna get called when, uh, when those passed in parameters change. Oh, you can abuse all of this stuff really nicely. Yes, yes, so all of these modifiers can be stacked. Uh, also, Kevin, in your example, you said you can use on click and on mouse enter. However, you can also use two on clicks, right? So there's there's no the, you can stack as many of them as you want, and they're not directly related to each other. Not that that matters that much. Chad, yes. Uh, very quickly, so why if the path expression of this dot set up popper changes, why doesn't it update? Uh, because did insert has already been called. Did insert, did insert and did, will destroy are one time only invocations. Will, uh, sorry, did update will be called in that case. That's, that's part of the difference in those APIs. I, see. I thought it had something to do with the closing parameter. No, that is just a typo. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so when I first authored these slides uh, for my EmberConf presentation, I was using action here. Uh, but then we subsequently changed what the uh, Octane model was not to use action. But very, very good. So for, for anyone following along, there's not supposed to be a closing parentheses in that invocation. Yes. Yes, exactly the same. Any argument to the helper is going to cause it to invalidate and rerun. Yes. 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 Are, are one shot. So just when it's inserted and when it's deleted, that's when we evaluate that, the values. That's actually unique in the yes. Like the, well, well, it's only invoked when the div when the div is inserted, right? That's the semantics. 
when it's inserted, you'll be past args, that the current value of the things. So this is the main, this main, the main thing is a little bit of a troll. You get inserts that is relative to the state of the element. You get updates not relative to the state of the element. Uh, yes, I agree. That would have been great to call out on the RFC. <laughs> I agree. But uh, so the good thing is it's in an add-on, so the, we can tweak it. The, the naming of did update is hard. Um, the, we do not currently have a way to know when the element itself has changed to do the thing what you think is intuitive. Uh, it's actually very, very hard. There's many things that could cause the element to update, and we, can't tell, we don't know them today. We don't track them in the rendering engine today. Um, I agree that that would be also what I would intuit. Like if you add, maybe you have a conditional class or something, and you update the class, you might want the thing to be refired. I could totally agree. Um, but that's just not the implementation. Yes, Matt. I'm going to encourage Robert to move on. Thank you. After I oh, <laughs> I see. Please hold. Yeah, which Robert will get into. Uh, however, they can be replaced if you add a common use of state API, like in your own modifiers, where you have the faults in the modifier itself, or like, oh, I can pin this thing and we'll destroy it. And then we probably want to set the teardown, like, hold on, there's only one instance, and if you see this state, this will right. give you that, and just give you arbitrary quotient. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine even in another future where you're allowed to define in the template functions, like you have imports, you have functions directly in the template. Wow, yeah. Yes. So, so I'm just saying you, you can imagine that's much simpler to reason yeah, about. So yeah. this is the justification for this being in an add-on. Like yes. It's documented, it's a happy task. It's supported, it's, it's yeah. Not yes, the, this is one of the, I think maybe the first, but one of the first things where we've officially said this is an add-on, but the add-on itself is not included automatically. But it is documented in the guides that if you need these, these functionalities, you pull it in. Anyways, moving on, Glimmer components. So Glimmer components, you're going to see build on all the things that we've talked about so far. Um, but let's talk a minute about Ember component. So uh, probably you've seen this before. It's in the RFC, and I've talked about it a couple of times. But um, Ember component is very complicated. Uh, there are 13 lifecycle hooks, 29 event handler methods. Uh, nine element customization properties, those are things like tag name, attribute binding, class name, binding, class names, class, classes, what else? I don't know. Lots of other things. There's nine. Uh, and then 21 standard framework functions. Those are things like get, set, get property, set properties, uh, add observer, get observer, uh, remove observer, I don't know, stuff like that. Anyways, it's really complicated. There's tons of surface area. It is very emergent over time. Some of, many of the things here were added prior to the RFC process. Um, things, uh, things like lots of these lifecycle hooks totally didn't go through the RFC process. These landed in like 113. We thought it was like the new way. Uh, and turns out we had some mistakes, um, which, which like you do. Anyways, the new API is super, super simple. Um, so Ali, this goes to the thing you asked before. The new Glimmer component API is li literally these things. This is it. Args are the things that are passed to you. It is a POJO, um, and it, it has different properties on it, but it's a POJO. There's a couple of Boolean for destroying and destroyed. This is for interop with things like Ember Lifeline and Ember Concurrency. Uh, there's a constructor, um, and there is a will destroy function. That is it. End of story. No more. All done. OK. Um, so you can, uh, you can imagine taking a computed, uh, sorry, a component like this uh, and transforming it to uh, Glimmer components like this. So this builds on using tract uh, for the, the data. Um, and uh, it should probably, assuming it gets first and last from args, it should probably be calling this an args at first, but whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, confirm. Yes, yeah, so they don't want need tract. So it would be a bad example. Just imagine, imagine, a, imagine a better example. Uh, yeah. So, um, anyways, uh, you you put all things together. Now you're asking, well, what happens about all the lifecycle hooks that we removed, and uh, are these stupid core team people just trying to screw me? Uh, the answer is no. We're trying to give you better ways to do the same things, um, so you can use those render modifiers specifically. That's what they're for. Did insert. 
You, you, you can author a thing that is effectively like what you could do before. You'd have to have a few more lines, but uh, like if you wanted to insert element, it will destroy element and did update. Uh, you could do all the things. You could, you could totally replicate the old Ember component API in the template. Just don't do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you can do... Yes, it is very, uh, yes, it is very hard. You'd have to, you, uh, you would pass lots of Ember quizzes if you could do that. But, uh, but the idea here is uh, the component, the template itself is outer HTML. So, uh, so there's no, there's no element modification API, there's no tag name, there's no element, uh, sorry, there's no um, attribute bindings or class name bindings, all that stuff is gone. You have the outer, the, t the uh, element in your own template and you can add did insert if you want insertion APIs and uh, DOM updates. Yes? Uh, earlier versions of bonus parts had a bounds object for property. Is that now different? So uh, the Glimmer, the Glimmer JS, the framework, uh, not Ember, but Glimmer JS has still has bounds and still has did insert element as a transitionary phase until they also get support for element modifiers. They do not currently have support for user provided element modifiers yet that is actively on my list of things to fix, but it's just time. Yeah, yeah time. Uh, but but they will they it will be removed. Bo bounds are gone. Uh, if you need access to the the DOM use an element modifier, that's the way you get access to DOM. Full stop, end of story. And wow, yeah. Robert, Glimmer components seem so simple. Yes, very simple. Very simple. The problem with bounds were the same basic problems that we had with did insert element that I mentioned. You have to dig in and find your stuff. Yes, exactly. Yes. Matt, go. I don't know what that means. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. So there are some cases. So I don't have any more slides, but whatever. There are some cases where um, folks, uh, fo folks have APIs that are difficult to model in the new paradigm. I just think that that is us not being imaginative enough. Um, for example, you can imagine wanting to do something if you're, uh, you want to diff your incoming arguments and do some special thing. Um, I personally think the perfect answer to that is not something like did receive adders and diffing your adders and figuring out what to do. It's to have a helper that is like on adder update, uh, like you pass the adder and it just re-invokes the helper. That is, I think, the better API. Um, it is driven by the, help, the template. It makes the template bound directly to the input and it is much simpler to reason about. If it needs to produce a value, you can even have it pass it to let and yield the block param and all this jazz. Um, but if it just needs to maybe fetch a, uh, like go hit an endpoint or something, I think that is also a good API. I've also been toying with and fooling around with APIs to do validation, but in the template. Um, so there's a couple of previous, uh, Examples of doing things like, um, uh, I guess, what is it? The you know like React props validation type stuff where you have um, where you, you want to say this component must accept these prop arguments types. prop types. That's the word. Thank you, John. Um, so I think Luke even authored a thing at one point. I don't know if you all still use that, but uh, but there's been a few different uh, use cases. But the problem with all of those is they're based on JavaScript, and that means that you could have template-only components and just have no validation, and that sucks. Um, so, uh, so I think, I think personally, a, possible, a plausible solution is writing those validations in, in the template as validation helpers, and they get stripped in prod, that kind of thing. They would work in both uh, JS and HBS, uh, or sorry, template-only components. I'm just saying that use your imaginations. You can figure out solutions to the problems that you have. It doesn't mean we need a single API, a single base class to handle every possible permutation. So that is all I've got. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. I went five minutes over. Screw it. You want to drop the mic? Do you want to do the... No, that, I don't want to break it. Although okay. these mics are really resilient. Yeah, this is pretty good. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight here at Adapar. I feel like this was an excellent RFC roundup. I look forward to doing it again and having you know, new faces come up to do some RFCs. Yeehaw! Yeehaw. Uh, if you'd like to join us on a walk to the, uh, the Cock and Bull, which is on 45th between 5th and 6th, the they will have the ginger beer. I'm just going to say yes.
See, look at that. He's going to bring homemade ginger beer, which is probably illegal. Uh, yeah, uh, we walk out the door, we take a right, then you take a left onto 45th. Uh, if you follow the leader, you will find us there. Thank you very much.